Yeah, hello to this live stream celebration. It's so great to have you with us. Um, it's great that you're here. I hope you're feeling cozy at home in your apartment, in your house, wherever you are, maybe even on the road. It's crazy in the times we live in. It's really crazy. And who would have thought of it a few weeks back? We are locked down in our houses. We spend so many hours in our home. I could never have imagined that a few weeks back. You know, I'm sitting here in a home, in a house, because my daily life today is really happening at home. Our uh, kids are at home for homeschooling, and my wife is doing a great job. She's not doing one job, she's doing many jobs at once. And I'm doing home office because our office is almost empty because we have to be distanced from each other. And everything is happening at home. Even people are doing exercises and workouts at home. And we are doing church at home. And it is great to have this opportunity to spend some time together today. You know, we tend to forget because of that corona crisis that in only three weeks time, we're going to celebrate Easter. How great is that? Easter is uh, one of the biggest events and happenings that ever happened in humankind. It was the time when Jesus died and he resurrected from the dead. And we will remember that in only three weeks time. And you, you know, I want to take you in a home, in a house in Jerusalem. It is the day, or not only the day, it is the night before Jesus dies. Jesus is sitting at a table in a home in Jerusalem like all the Jews did at that time. They gathered together in houses to celebrate Passover. They had everything set ready on the table to think back another 1,100 years before Christ in the times of slavery in Egypt. Israel was, was um, serving as slaves in Egypt and then God told them to put everything ready for the night when he would take them from slavery into liberation. Passover is a feast that all the Jews were celebrating throughout thousands of years until today. Jesus celebrated it and he took his friends in remembering the times in Egypt. So today, when we sit here with Jesus at the table, he told them, as you can read in the verse, he was excited to be together with his disciples. He was excite, excited because he knew he was going to die the next day. So he was taking it to get ready for the day that was coming. So when Jesus celebrates it, he thinks back. And let's do the same thing. When we celebrate this Passover with Jesus, we want to think back another thousand years in the times of Egypt. It is the night before the liberation. It is the night before Exodus. Four hundred and thirty years. For four hundred and thirty years, we are slaves now in Egypt. 430 years of oppression, sweat and tears in our bones. Then Moses came. He wanted to lead us into the land that God promised to our forefather Abraham. Suddenly there was hope again, but things got worse. The nine actual plagues couldn't bring Pharaoh to his knees. After every plague, we hoped that we are leaving now. Come on, we are leaving. After every plague, we got disappointed. And the Pharaoh got even more cruel. Sometimes there's such a huge gap between the promises and the reality. And now there is plague number 10. Every firstborn of the Egyptians shall die. My eldest shall be spared for the blood of the Lamb. God, I'm afraid for my eldest. But, but Moses was very clear. He said to us, that same night, 
They are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire, with the head, legs and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay. Herbs are there. Ugh. Bitter. Okay, fits to my emotional state. Ugh. Bread is there. Unleavened. I bet it tastes even more worse than the herbs. But, but everything has to go fast now. Moses told us, no time for yield. Stick in my hands, shoes are on, clothes are on. We are ready. Where's the family? Family! Family, come together, hurry up! Dinner's ready, come on! We have to hurry, we will leave soon! Family, come on, please! Hurry up, come on! I'm sure you can feel the tension in that house. The father of the house is really nervous because he knows in that night, in this specific night, it's going to be the night of truth. The angel of death is going to pass all over Egypt and kill every firstborn in the land. And he didn't know if it's going to happen also in his house. He didn't know if everything he put ready in the family would be enough to be saved from death. You know, the situation we live in at the moment is really challenging as well. We don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you are in your home and you feel like that father. You don't know what's going to happen to you in the corona crisis. You don't know if it's going to hit your house as well. You don't know if it's going to hit you or people you love, your parents, your grandparents. You don't know what's going to happen to your finances, to your business. We don't just, we just don't know. But it's here. Darkness is around this house and we don't know what's going to happen. The challenge of these families all over Egypt and specifically in the houses of the Israelites was, was the following. They had been slaves for 430 years. They had been slaves. Their bodies were full of marks. They had a mindset of slaves. 400 and years, nothing had happened. And even in the last weeks, there were nine plagues and the Pharaoh just didn't move. He didn't change his mind. You know, our challenge sometimes, it's not that we are in difficult circumstances. Our challenge very often is our mindset that we still think as slaves because we don't think ahead what God could do with our lives because we think back in our experience. We think back and we see nothing happened. My addiction is still here. My sickness is still a big pain in my body and we feel depressed. In this situation, the Israelites had two things. First, they had a promise from God. Let's read it. Just a few verses before they put everything ready for Passover, God gave him a promise and he said, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. So God had promised them that he would send them into liberation. You know, in challenging times like these, it's so important that we remember God's promises over our lives. Maybe you feel lonely in your house day by day. Then know that God tells you, I will be with you. I will not forsake you or leave you. I will be with you. Maybe you have a spirit of fear in you because you realize you don't know what's going to happen. But God tells you, you don't have a spirit of fear. I gave you a spirit of strength and of love and of self-discipline. Think of God's promises. And if you cannot think of them, open your Bible. Pray God's promises over your life because it's so important to change our mindset out of a slavery mindset into a 
possibility mindset. The second thing that the Israelites had in that time were the instructions God had given them. He told them how to put everything ready, how to celebrate the Passover. He told them what to do and they obeyed him. That's what they did. They obeyed him. We read that in Second Moses where it says, in Exodus it says, then the people of Israel went and did what the Lord had told Moses and Aaron. You know, they put the sandals on their feet. They had the belt around their loins. They were ready to go. They obeyed what God told them, even if it didn't make sense in a status of slavery to put everything ready. God told them, put that belt around your loins. Put it that you're ready so your feet can move. In that time, people had very long ropes. They had cloaks that went down onto the floor and that couldn't even move. And God told them, put that belt around your loins so that you're ready. I want to show it to you so you can imagine how it is. God tells them to gird their loins. You know, if they gird their loins, they will lift up their cloak so the feet are free to move and they will be ready when the, the Lord will send them into liberation. A few weeks back, I was thinking about Easter and was praying like the whole ICF family and asking God, how can I be more and more like Jesus in my life? And that kept hearing one word and it was the word flexibility and they didn't know what to do with the word flexibility and I thought of my body and I realized okay I'm really strong I have good muscles I have endurance but I realized I don't have so much flexibility in my body I cannot even stretch my arms straight out there always stays an angle in my elbow and I realized, okay, I will take the challenge, Jesus. I don't know what it's going to happen, but I will do exercise my flexibility until Easter. So if you see in the, in the picture, I do exercises every morning for my flexibility. I try to become more flexible in my legs, in my back and everywhere. And my kids are laughing at me because it looks really stiff. But I feel some advances already. But you know, the interesting thing is not that I do the exercise, but that I realized God was making me ready for what is happening now. The last weeks have been the most challenging weeks um, for many of us in the ICF team. We had to be very flexible. Everything now is digital that used to be really touchy before, and I like to be touchy. You know, everything changed and God challenged me to be more flexible, to more, be more, have greater agility in my life. And I like it that God speaks to me and makes me ready. So if we obey what God tells us, we will be liberated. He will go, we will go into liberation for every challenge we have. So please, for the next weeks, for the seasons we are in, gird your loins, get ready, get ready to move because Jesus wants to liberate you. He wants to bring you in a new land like the Israel, Israelites. He wants to bring you into the promised land. Gird your loins, be ready and read the Bible. Get ready in your mindset. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about girding the loins. First Peter says, therefore with minds that are alert and fully sober, gird up the loins of your mind. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Jesus wants, to, wants you to gird your loins, to be ready when he is coming and he will come also in your life. Let's go back at the table of Passover. Jesus was sitting there a thousand one hundred years after the Exodus. He was thinking back with his disciples and celebrating Passover that Jesus had liberated his people into the promised land. And there's a special moment in all the Passover feasts is where the father in the house will take the bitter herbs on the table. And the bitter herbs on the table, they represent the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. People dip it into the salt water together with a piece of bread. They dip it in there 
And when they do that, they think of the salt water, and salt water means they had tears of bitterness, they had tears of sadness, of mourning in slavery. And when they eat the bitter herbs with salt water, they realize God liberated us from this bitterness. Before Jesus dipped the water with the bitter herbs into the salt water, they, the, the disciples asked him one question. They asked him, who is be the one who will betray you? And you can read it in the verse, Jesus answers, He says, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. So in that very moment, when they thought of the bitterness and the mourning of slavery, Jesus passes this bread with the bitter herbs to Judas. Four hundred. The prophets have been quiet for four hundred years. And then he shows up. Jesus, our rabbi. He was always talking about the new kingdom all the time. We all had hope and faith in vain. His kingdom won't come. It won't. The Romans are still here. Nothing, nothing really changed. It might be that he's a great speaker, that he can make the lame walk and the blind see, but he's not a king. And there's nobody else for miles around. Something needs to change. This can go on forever. And he's not only talking about dying. We bet on the wrong guy. For the whole time we were walking in the wrong direction. But this, will change now. I'm taking matters into my own hands. <laughs> Judas was the son of his generation. Even that generation of the Israelites, before Jesus came, there were 400 years where they didn't hear of God. There were no prophets, no kings that heard of, of the Lord. And Judas was putting all his hope into this Jesus who said he was the king and he would establish a new kingdom. And Judas had the big hope that Jesus would rise as a king. And we know that the very moment when he got these bitter herbs in his hands, all the bitterness came up in him and he left the table to betray Jesus. There are moments in our lives when Bitterness is really bitter in our mouth. And it's not only bitter in our mouth, it's bitter in our hearts. Maybe in your life you had, there were a lot of moments when you had mourning. You didn't expect God to do what happened in your life. You expected God to, to act differently. You expected him to protect you from everything that's going to come the way against you. And he seemed to have forsaken you and your heart became bitter. Look, the mistake Judas did is that he left, left the table of Jesus. The mistake Judas did is he let bitterness be rooted in his heart and it made him disappear from the reality and the uh, presence of Jesus. This is a big mistake and this is not what's going to happen in your life. Let us read a verse that challenges us to think hard about bitterness in our lives. In Hebrews 12, there it says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You know, the bitterness, the mourning in your life, it might be very dominant. I had mourning, I had bitterness in the last season sometimes and oftentimes. But I realized I cannot let it happen that it is going to be in my heart. I want to 
take it out from my heart and give it to Jesus and make my heart soft again. It is so important to stay with Jesus, to bring bitterness, to bring tears and mourning into his presence, not to leave the table. It is the biggest mistake to let bitterness make us take a distance from God and the church. So in these seasons of Corona crisis, maybe you already are sick. Maybe you lost your business and it's really bitter in your mouth and in your mind. Be aware that it should not become a root in your life. Let us take care for each other in this season as Christians, as a family, as a church. Let us call each other. And I did that throughout the last weeks. I called business people, I called families, and I tried to encourage people that we stay close to Jesus because we cannot let bitterness and fear be rooted in our hearts. It's not going to bring good fruit. So the biggest mistake Judas did he left the table just in the moment before Jesus revealed who he really is. Let's see what happened next. Jesus was sitting at that table. Judas left to betray him. And the next part in the Passover feast is that the father in the house is going to take the bread. And the bread in every um, Judah uh, Passover feast is, is, is in three parts. There is a, is a bag on the table, and in the bag there are three breads. One on the top, in the middle, and a lower bread. So the meaning of these three breads is the following. The Father is the first bread. The second bread stands for the Messiah who is going to come and liberate the people of God. And the third bread stands for the Holy Spirit. This is the, the messianic interpretation of this bread. So we read in the Bible that when Jesus was sitting there with his friends, he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. In every Passover feast, the Father will take out the middle bread which stands for the Messiah, he will take it out and he will break it in two halves. One of these halves he will put back in the back and the other half he will wrap it into a cloth and put it aside. And this is funny for the kids because we, he will put it aside, he will hide it somewhere in the house. And in the end of the feast, the kids are gonna look for it all over the house. It's just like, like the, the Easter celebration here in Switzerland when the kids are looking for the eggs and the chocolate. So in the end of the feast, when the kids have, they found the bread in the cloth, he will take it. And what Jesus did in the end of the feast, he took it out. It was already a broken bread and he broke it and he passed one piece to each person of his friends at the table. Now, if you realize that this bread stands for the Messiah and Jesus says, this is my body that is gonna be broken and I want to give it to you, then we start to realize there's a big, big meaning in what Jesus is doing here. I want to show it to you. First, the middle bread stands for the Messiah. Jesus says, this is my body. This bread is my body. So he says, I am the Messiah. Second, the bread is unleavened. There is no yeast in it. So Jesus has no mistakes, no sin. It means Jesus is the, the, the Messiah without any mistakes. The bread is going to be broken in two parts. It means Jesus is going to die on the cross. His body is going to be broken. It will be wrapped in a cloth like his body was after the crucifixion. And it will be put away for a certain time. Jesus' body was put away in a grave for three days. And in the end, he came back out of the grave. The cloth in the graveyard, they were empty. Jesus was resurrected and now Jesus tells his disciple, he says, this is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. So when Jesus passes the bread to each person here on the table, he says, I am your Messiah. I am the one who will liberate you from everything that is hindering you. I am the one who will liberate you from bitterness, from mourning in your life. I am the one who is going to take the burden of your sin onto my body and you can be part of the life that I will bring to you. Today I want to invite you to take, to take it from Jesus, what he is offering you. He is giving you the invitation just like he did to the disciples. He invites you to be part of the miracle of resurrection. Maybe your experiences tell you there's not going to be a breakthrough in my life. Jesus says, take the bread and eat from it. This is my body. It is resurrected from the dead. It is life. Maybe, maybe you are mourning. Maybe you are afraid. Maybe there is sin in your life. Maybe there is addiction in your life or sickness. Jesus took everything on himself and took it on the, took it on the cross. And he is offering you the new life, the resurrected body. You can be part of it and you can be part of the miracle. The challenge in Passover is that it is before the miracle happens. Jesus celebrated Passover before he went to the cross. The Israelites, they, they celebrated Passover before they were liberated into the promised land. Today, when we celebrate communion, we do it before we had our breakthroughs. Maybe before you were liberated from the from everything that is hindering you, from your addiction, from your sickness. The end of the Passover feast is that all the Jews, they sing a song. It is a worship song. And we read it in the Bible. You can read it. When the end came of the Passover feast, they were singing the hallelujah, the worship song. And when they had finished the worship song, Jesus and his disciples, he went out in the garden, in the olive garden. And if you know the Bible, you know that Jesus suffered and he suffered really hard to do the hardest part of his mission, to give his life away for you and for me. There was blood running down his face because he sweated blood out of his body to take on himself what is hindering you, what is in your heart, what is trying to be bitter in you. And Jesus says, take and eat because I died and I was resurrected to bring life to you. We will end the celebration in the same way like the Passover. We will sing a worship song now and take the opportunity for this song to go around your house and your home to find wine or juice and the bread, a piece of bread, and we will celebrate communion in the remembrance that Jesus liberated us. So let us get ready. Maybe you have everything set before you, then we start into the worship song, the Hallel like Jesus did. And then we will have communion together. Without us, 
It's not a secret why the name of Jesus is so powerful. It is because he is the son of God. And it's also because he went all the way, even through the pain, even when it cost his life to follow what God wanted from him. He had a promise on his life as well. He had instructions from his father as well. And it was not an easy time. And to celebrate Passover feast, to celebrate communion with his friends was excited for him or exciting for him because he knew what's going to come. He was taking the moment to get his loins girded, to get ready to go out in, out in this garden. And this is the, the reason why his name is so powerful, because he didn't leave the table. He didn't leave God's will when it was really hard. It's because he said, not mine will, but yours will be done. And he didn't like what's going to happen. But because he did it, because he went on the cross, because he gave his body and his blood, there is liberation for you and for me today. That's the reason because he's why his name is so powerful to you and to me. 
when we take the bread today for communion, let us, let us read the verse again because it's the invitation to you to feel the power of Jesus in your life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. When we take communion, when we eat the bread this today, we think about Jesus who gave his body away and it was a big price. And you can give him your bitterness, you can give him your bad experiences, your disappointment, you can give him your sin, your sickness, because he took it already on the cross. So let us eat the bread, thankful in our hearts for the Lord, for the King of Kings who gave his life for us. Let's do it by thanking him. Jesus, we thank you for the bread, which stands for your body this today. Thank you that you gave your life. Thank you that we can be saved and thank you that we can be liberated. And we eat it with a thankful heart, honoring that you gave your life and it cost you everything. So let us eat the bread wherever we are. I can feel that there are people who have never accepted the in, in invitation of Jesus. Maybe you sit there and you realize your life, your home, your house is not filled with the light of Jesus. And you have a hard time to accept the invitation. I tell you, it's very easy. It's just staying at the table. It's just staying in his presence, not leaving, not going away. Maybe you feel like leaving right now. Stay where you are. I want to invite you for a simple prayer right now to give your life to Jesus, to tell him to come into your house and to stay there. And I don't mean your house, I mean your heart, your life, your everything you are. Jesus, I just feel that the invitation today is just exactly for me. And I accept it. I give you my life, Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life, be my King. I give you my disappointment, I give you my sin, I give you my sickness, and I thank you that you give me new life, that you liberated me, that you bring me into the promised land for me personally. Thank you, Jesus. Then Jesus took the wine and the wine, he explained them, stands for his blood that is shed on the cross. They were drinking the wine and they didn't know what it meant because it was the night before Jesus died. But we today, when we drink the wine, we know it really happened. Jesus went up on that cross. He took the cross on himself. He was nailed there. He was really tortured and his blood ran out of his heart mixed with water. And he did it because he loves you, because he wants you to be part of his family, of the godly family. And when, when we drink the wine or the juice this right now, we wanna realize it is another invitation that we can be cleansed from sin. We can be cleansed from sickness and we don't have to be afraid in this season of a coronavirus because we know there is one king who is crowned and it is Jesus Christ. And his name is so powerful because he died and was resurrected from the dead. So when we drink the wine, we can say, Jesus, thank you that you shed your blood, that my heart is washed clean. Let us thank him for this blood and drink it, honoring what he did for you and for me. You can have Jesus in your life because it's the invitation today.
Jesus, thank you that we can go into the next season, the next week, maybe even the next day or the next coming night, knowing that we are ready because you are in our lives and it's everything we need. We need you and we have you. And you said, stay in me so I will stay in you. Thank you that we can get our loins girded by taking communion. Maybe we can do it every single day throughout the next weeks to realize who Jesus really is. Thank you that you gird our loins this today. That you come into our house, into our apartment, into our lives and we can have your presence. We can have hope in our lives. We can have faith in our lives instead of fear. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you did for us. Amen. Let us join into the worship again because we have a king who is really king. We serve a God who is really the king of kings and his name is so powerful because he paid the price and he is resurrected and he took home in your home, in your apartment and in your heart and he will guide you through any season in your life. Just make sure you stay with him. Let's worship him wherever you are in your house. generation should be more educated than us they should be more equipped than us more empowered than us they should be smarter they should have bigger dreams see further go further that's normal that's how it should be every one of us will ultimately leave what we live not just what we do, but the spirit in which we live. Have you ever thought in your own life, somebody should do something? The somebody, usually it's you.